Hello, welcome to this video on Boeing 737-800 systems and subsystems. Today we're talking about the 737 engine starting and ignition systems. It is a very important system to understand how your engine starts when you begin the start sequence. Uh, now, obviously the 737-800 is powered by two CFM 56-7B engines, one on each side. Engines one on the left and two on the right. And let's uh, basically go through what our parts are. We have our inlet here and our fan, which is going to draw in large quantities and a large volume of air, either drawing it through the bypass duct for the secondary airflow, creating 80% of the thrust, or through the primary airflow that goes through the core. Primary airflow is going to go to the... Uh, low pressure compressors and then through a nine stage high pressure compressor or N2 which also has an accessory drive connected to it which we'll talk about in a second then a combustor where the air is mixed with fuel and coming from fuel nozzles and ignited now we can either we can either use igniters in order to ignite the air fuel mixture which we use in certain phases of flight and when we're on the ground or we can uh, we don't use igniters because it is a self-sustaining uh, combustion process uh, in most stages of flight once we get the engines running. Then from there, uh, these hot and high pressure exhaust gases are directed to the high and low pressure turbine stages. High pressure turbine is only one stage, as a matter of fact, which are going to extract the energy out of these exhaust gases and this energy is used to spin these turbine blades and these turbine stages, which are connected to some common shafts or spools that in turn drive their associated low or high pressure compressors through uh, these mechanically independent shafts, uh, although they do spin concentrically around each other. Then from there, they go through this exhaust duct uh, where they are at a very high velocity, they're accelerated at a high velocity out of the engine, generating thrust to propel the airplane forward via Newton's third law. So that's how the engine works. Now the biggest problem facing engineers is how do we start the engine? We know what the process is when the engine is running, but how do we actually start it? Now this is a problem that uh, can be solved in three ways. We need three essential elements, and these elements are the same for combustion of an internal uh, combustion engine or a gas turbine engine. It doesn't matter. Anything that undergoes combustion needs the same three elements. We have air, and this air is driven in through the inlet by the fan to the combustor eventually or the combustion chamber. Then we need fuel. Uh, the 7.3 has three different fuel tanks that house Jet A in the United States or Jet A1 type fuels, kerosene based fuels. And these are all essentially the same, uh, except they do have different, different properties and temperatures like the freezing point, negative 40 and negative 47 degrees Celsius are different, just very similar, uh, but minor differences are involved. And of course, Jet A is US and Jet A1 is in Europe and other places of the world. Then we also need an ignition source uh, to create the spark that is needed to get this combustion of the air fuel mixture going. Now, most times in flight, of course, this is a self-sustaining cycle and we don't need to rely on any sort of ignition system. But for ground starting, we need two different igniters inside of each engine. These are AC electrical driven igniters, left and right inside of both engines and they both have different sources different uh, AC buses that they use to receive their electrical power and these plugs provide the spark that is necessary to ignite uh, the fuel air mixture and get the process going so those three elements are very necessary but another thing that is also necessary uh, that you do not need in a car engine or in most other engines is something called bleed air or pneumatic air pressure. Now, the big problem faced by engineers when starting the engine is that they needed to accelerate the high pressure compressor to a speed where the engine was drawing in enough air inside of the engine and inside of the combustion chamber to where it can then be mixed with fuel and ignited. But they first needed to draw air into the engine. 
from they needed to take an engine that was sitting still with really not much airflow going through it, and then they needed to put some airflow through it before they can start it. And that problem was solved by using bleed air. Now, bleed air comes from three different sources. You can use another uh, running engine from the fifth and ninth stages of the high pressure compressor. You can use an APU, uh, and the APU uses a load compressor that will create bleed air, draw it through an APU bleed air valve down along a duct that runs along parallel to the keel beam and then into the pneumatic manifold. And then we can also use a ground air cart or a ground air start cart. You can also call it a huffer cart as well. But all three of these will bring pneumatic air into what's called the pneumatic manifold. And from the pneumatic manifold, this hot, high-pressure pneumatic air is supplied to all of its consumer systems, one of which is the engine start system. Now the bleed air will flow into here and reach a start valve. When this start valve is closed, it is blocking this bleed air from entering the engine to begin turning the compressor. But when this starter valve is open, it is going to allow bleed air flow through the start valve into what's called an air-driven starter. It may also be called a starter turbine, a starter motor, or just simply a starter. But first, we need to figure out how do we open the start valve to allow this to happen. Well, on the forward overhead panel of the 737-800, there are two engine start switches, one for each engine, and they contain a few different detents. We can see it right over here. They have the ground detent, auto or off, depending on which company version, continuous, and then flight detent. Now, all of these detents do different things. Continuous supplies uh, ignition and flight deals with ignition, but ground deals with bleed air. Now when you turn the start switch to the ground position, normally starting two, engine two first and then number one, the engine bleed air valve right over here is going to close, or it's also called the pressure regulating and shutoff valve, and it will close if it's not already closed to prevent any fifth and ninth stage bleed air from coming back into the pneumatic manifold. So that's closed, but it is also going to energize a solenoid and via switch holding relay that will hold it in the ground position. And this will open the start valve. And it's worth noting that it is electrically controlled and pneumatically operated. There's an electrical signal sent to where the pneumatic uh, system will then actually physically drive the valve open. You'll get a start valve indication light on your upper DU, uh, which should hopefully be illuminated steady if the start valve open indication is blinking. That means that there is an uncommanded opening of the start valve, and you should probably get that checked out with maintenance. So from there, it goes into this starter, and this starter uh, is composed of a turbine that is going to extract this energy from the bleed air, and it'll begin turning this turbine. Now, by turning this, it will drive the accessory drive or the accessory gearbox. The accessory gearbox is connected to the N2 high pressure compressor, high pressure compressor shaft, which contains nine different stages, and it drives accessories kind of like the accessory drives on your car. It'll drive supply oil pumps and supply, or excuse me, scavenge pumps, engine driven fuel pumps, uh, engine driven hydraulic pumps as well and also an IDG, a generator that will spin to provide you with AC electrical power. So this starter is going to drive your accessory gearbox, which will then begin turning this high-pressure compressor, this N2 shaft. Then once it starts turning and the shaft begins accelerating, you're going to draw in airflow through the engine, and eventually at 25% N2 uh, indicated on your engine display, that is when you have enough air flowing to where you can actually add fuel into the engine without causing any sort of hot start or other start anomalies. Now, how do we add fuel? Well, we have these engine start levers right here on the throttle quadrant right behind the throttle. And there are two, dis two detents, one for each engine, cut off and idle, and they control valves. So cut off closes valves, idle will open valves. And when you put the respective engine's engine start lever to the idle position from cutoff, it is going to send 
a signal to open two separate valves in the engine fuel system. We have a spar valve and we have an engine fuel valve, which is also called a high pressure fuel shutoff valve. And the spar valve is located on the engine wing mounting stations and allows fuel flow to come from uh, the fuel manifold and the fuel tanks into the engine fuel system. After passing through the spar valve, it goes through IDG oil, fuel heat exchangers, and it goes through the main fuel-cooled oil cooler, where the fuel and oil from either the IDG or main engine oil will exchange heat with each other, which will heat up the fuel to temperatures more efficient for combustion, and also to temperatures won't, where you will not have any uh, freezing or waxing and crystallization of the fuel in the fuel lines, which can block stuff and prevent fuel flow from going into it, causing flame outs, and also lower the temperature of the oil because it gets very hot as it's doing its lubrication job inside the accessory drives, inside the IDG, and inside the main bearings and gears. From there, you'll have some engine-driven fuel pumps driven by that N2 shaft and accessory gearbox that will increase the pressure of the fuel to pressures that are more efficient for combustion. And then we have uh, the engine fuel valve. It is not depicted on this schematic, but the engine fuel valve uh, is also controlled by the engine start lever. lever. It will open and basically permit unobstructed fuel flow into the engine, into the fuel nozzles. It'll also pass through a fuel flow meter measuring fuel flow in pounds per hour that will be indicated on your display units. Now, once it passes through all of that, it'll go into some fuel nozzles where it is sprayed in an atomized uh, spray pattern, mixed with the air, and then ignited. So at 25%, that's when you add the fuel. Now, another important thing to note is that we also need our ignition. Now, when we turn the engine start switch to the ground detent, we are arming the igniters and the igniter plugs inside the engine, arming it. It is not activating them, it is arming them. Once we move the engine start levers from cutoff to idle, that is actually turning on the igniters, so they were armed before, but now it is uh, electrically exciting the igniters, and they will be providing the spark that you need to start combustion. Two igniters left and right inside of each engine, Left is driven by the respective AC transfer bus, so left engine, AC transfer bus 1, right engine, AC transfer bus 2. And the right igniter is powered by your AC standby bus, and you can always use this ignition select switch right here and turn it to ignition right if you want to test your AC standby bus. Some companies make you do ignition right to test that bus on the first flight of the day, but not all of them do. Uh, and of course, AC standby bus is driven by AC transfer bus number one, but in the event of standby power, uh, where you're losing your main sources of electricity, you're going to go to standby power mode, and it is driven by a static inverter. Static inverter will take 28 volt DC from the main and auxiliary batteries and convert it to 115 volt AC through that static inverter to drive the AC standby bus, which is where the right igniter is. Now these igniters inside the combustor, yep, provide the spark. It's worth noting that here you can select ignition left or ignition right, and depending on what you select there, that is the igniter that will be used on the engine start, and that is the same igniter that will be used when you move it to the continuous position. When you move it to the flight position, regardless of the ignition select switch, it is going to energize both igniters because at that point, if you put it in flight, you're probably in a very dire situation and you need to restart your engine very quickly. And you need all the help you can get. So from there, you're going to see your engine accelerate EGT or exhaust gas temperature, which is the temperature of the exhaust gases as it reaches the turbine section. That temperature in Celsius is going to rise, hopefully not too quickly, no hot start. Uh, you're going to see N1, low pressure shaft, and N2 shaft speeds increase. You're going to see oil pressure indications increase as the engine-driven oil pumps are uh, pressurizing oil throughout the system, allowing the oil to start doing its work inside of the engine. So you're going to see that begin to increase. Uh, and those...